All right, welcome everyone to um, Innovate Pasadena's Ask Me Anything with our very special guest today. Before I hand things over to him, um, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, our organization here. So I'll also bring up the chat window so I can see if anyone has any questions or comments. Uh, feel free to say hi, introduce yourself in chat, by the way, so a little housekeeping there. Uh, so Innovate Pasadena, you know, our goal is to strengthen innovation throughout the greater Pasadena area. Uh, we do that through networking, education, resource exchange. Um, we have 30 supporting um, corporations, individuals, more than 160 corporate partners, and in excess 300 plus uh, collaborators. Um, and these are folks who run startups, who run um, brick and mortar outfits, governments, universities, nonprofits. It's really across the, um, the eagle sphere of folks in the greater Pasadena area who work with us, and we're proud to work with them. Um, our mission here um, is to advance the greater Pasadena area as the center of technology and design, which it has been for quite a while. Um, as many of you know, Pasadena is the home to um, Every, everything from world-class universities to one of the premier space agencies uh, in the world and the premier uh, art and design institution. So there's a lot that's happening uh, in this space and we're, we're proud to be a part of it and to invite you to participate. And uh, let's see what else we want to cover here. And so, um, you know, if you want to learn more about Innovate, please go to innovatepasadena.org where you can learn more about what we are offering, what we can, what we can bring to the table, um, no matter where you are in your career, in your business, open to everyone. And um, we would love to have you be a part of it. So with all of that said, um, and your request to make your impact, let me introduce someone who has made an impact in many ways. Uh, our special guest today is Dan Poppenmeyer. Um, he's going to talk about the creative process and thinking outside the box. Dan is a cartoonist extraordinaire, television actor, director, writer, has done uh, some amazing animation work, and we are very happy, delighted to have him here for our Ask, uh, Ask Me Anything. So I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Take it away. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Pavanmeyer. I have, uh, I have worked on uh many 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 cartoon shows i i started off on uh on the teenage mutant ninja turtles and uh and then the simpsons and then rocco's modern life and family guy and spongebob and eventually i show, sold my own show called phineas and ferb and it was like the number one animated show for kids for like seven years and uh uh, and we're now doing a new movie with those characters. We, we did a, a show, uh, we, we did a, f a finale of that series in about five years ago, and we did a show called Milo Murphy's Law in between there. And uh, we did a crossover with those characters, and we, and we realized we missed them, sort of. And so when Disney asked if we would do a, uh, a movie with those characters, we uh, uh, for the for Disney Plus we we said we jumped at the chance and that's coming out August twenty eighth on Disney Plus and uh, I think it's one of the best things I've done I th I'm I'm very very happy with it so uh, oh I like that somebody has the lumberzacks as their as their background there that's <laughs> that's very fun um, but oh, look at everybody's got better backgrounds than me I need to I need to. Uh, Somebody's in a, what is that? A, is that a DC three or something what a, for Ron Cohen? Um, but uh, um, anyway, so I've been doing this for a long time um, and enjoying it. And I, and I feel like I'm, I'm in the best position uh, that, that I could have asked for because I go to work every day and I draw silly pictures and I talk in silly voices and I tell silly stories and I write silly songs and, uh, and I do all these things that I was doing before when I was unemployed, it's just people weren't paying me for it. So it's really sort of, you know, it doesn't feel like work if you're doing what you love to, love to do for work. When we started it uh, at uh, Disney, we sort of had to change 
Um, I was working at Fox and before and then Nickelodeon before that. And uh, when Disney bought the show, we sort of had to change the way Disney did business in a lot, in, in a lot of ways for them to do this show. We, we, uh, Phineas and Ferb was uh, always conceived of as a show that would be done from storyboards, meaning you would, um, you would give an outline to some storyboard artists and they would write the dialogue and the gags um, themselves and get, then give us a storyboard. And it was very hard to get Disney to understand that that's how we wanted to do the show because they said, wait, so when are we going to see a script? I said, you won't see a script. You'll see an outline. And then two weeks later, you'll see a, see a storyboard pitch and it'll have drawings and, and, and everything like that. And, uh, and, they, and they were very uncomfortable with that. So we, so we had them let us hire two storyboard artists so we could do it because we, we had done the pilot that way. And uh, I think they just wanted to see that it wasn't lightning in a, in a bottle, that it was, it was something that we could do more than once. So we hired two storyboard artists and we did two more episodes that way. And, uh, and it gave them enough confidence to, to let us do something that Disney had never done before. Now, Disney had done this originally in the 50s with their shorts. This is how they made those. They just didn't think it could be done on a TV, on a TV budget. And we... Uh, uh, and we sort of proved that to them. And then we had other fights that we had to had to go through. Like, I I do the voice of Doctor Doofenshmirtz on the show. He's the, he's sort of the the uh, the antagonist of uh, of the series. And uh, and they weren't going to. I did it in the pilot, and they were still wanted me to audition other people to do this in the show because they had a rule that uh, their executive producers did not do voices on the show on their shows. And I was like, so where does that rule come from? I, I don't know. It was just, it's just a rule that we've had at, uh, at Disney. And, and, and I said, well, how's that rule working out for you? Is it, is it, is it gaining you the people, you know, the, the, the talent that you want? Is, is it attracting the talent that you want? For instance, if Seth MacFarlane came in here and said he wanted to do voices on his own show, would you say, I'm sorry, our executive producers don't do that. And they were like, oh, um, I don't know why we do that. Okay, well, maybe you can do the do the voice. It was the same thing. We wrote the theme song, and uh, and they were like, "We, but our executive producers don't write songs on the show," and we're like, uh, "Well, why is that? I don't know. It's just a rule. So, is it a rule that we could we could get around?" And they were like, "I don't know." We wrote the theme song, and we wrote uh, the Gitchy Gitchy Goo song for the for the Flop Stars episode, and we wrote the Perry the Platypus theme, and we played it for them at like the third pitch of the, of the episodes. And suddenly they were like, we really like these songs. Can you write a song for every single episode? And we were like, yes, we can. And that's how I ended up writing three or 400 songs for Disney in, over, over a period of 10 years. So, uh, so it was sort of like getting them to think out of the box of, of the way they had always done business. And I think a lot of that is what contributed to the show becoming this huge monster hit. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it was just sort of like sticking to our guns. Luckily, I had been in animation long enough that I had a little bit of clout and was able to, uh, to sort of shake that around and say, say, you know, look, I can go back to Family Guy if you want. They're, they were actually paying me more money at Family Guy. When, when I sold my own show at Disney Channel, I took a thousand dollar a week cut in pay because Family Guy was prime time money and Disney Channel was was uh, daytime money and and so so I always had that I could point to and say well I, you know if you don't like it I can go back there um, that that ability to sort of um, say say this is this is my the line in the sand that I won't go past allowed them to sort of give me the things that I needed to get the, to get the show done. Um, so it, it's, the show was created by me and my buddy Swampy Marsh, and we did it for 10 years. And then we did a show called Milo Murphy's Law. And now we're, we're we just finished this, uh, this movie that's going on Disney Plus. So, um, so I guess we can take, um, that's, that's, I guess, as much of an introduction as I, as I think I need. They, they sent me some, uh, some questions that you guys have sent in, and I'll, I'll go through those, and then I'll see if there's questions we can get from, 
uh, from the rest of the uh, of the group here. So um, let me move this over this way. Okay. So the first question is, what may uh, what major would you suggest for someone who is considering a path like yours? I was not an animation major. I was a film major, and I wasn't even a film major. I went to USC and applied to the film school and took nothing but film classes for two years and did not get into the film major. Um, so I ended up uh, dropping out of school. So, so I'm just a cautionary tale, you know, kids stay in school or this could happen to you. Um, the, the thing that I, I always tell people who want to go into animation is no one is going to look at your um, college diploma. They are gonna look at your work. What you do want to do is you want to go to a place that teaches you the things that you don't know. Because right now you don't even know what you don't know about animation, but you wanna go and get an education. I personally am not really caught up in the finishing of a, of a degree. Um, I, I uh, met a, a wonderkind artist named uh, Brittany Myers um, a few years back, a friend of mine's it was the, the daughter of a friend of a friend. And uh, he showed me her art and I was so impressed. I had her come out to the studio and stuff. And she asked whether she should go to, to school. And I said, you should apply to CalArts and you will absolutely get in. She, this is one of the best artists I've ever met. Um, and she was 15 at the time that, that, that I met her. She's just gotten better and better and better. And, but, but I told her, you know, figure out whether you want to stay in there because there's a lot of good to be had from going to a school where everybody is doing the same thing as you. This is going to be your tribe when you get out. This, these are going to be the people that you work with. But you may discover that like you could go to any studio in town and get work right now and you'd get a, be getting paid to draw rather than paying the university to draw. Um, so she did it for one year and then she, like, she said, oh, no, I'm going to go. I'm going to finish. She did it for one year and then she, then she said, you know, I think I've learned what I need to learn here. And she is now the lead uh, character designer on a, on a feature. Glenn Keane, who was the, the big animator, he animated the Beast from Beauty and the Beast and Pocahontas and, and Pocahontas. He's, he's like a legend in animation circles. He was quoted in an, in an interview just recently saying that he started drawing different because he was watching how Brittany Myers was drawing. That's, you know, like um, they just look at her portfolio and I knew her portfolio was good enough to get work. Um, what you should do is draw, 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 draw all the time, figure out uh, uh, what you like to draw, figure out what, uh, what you could draw on other shows, um, uh, draw what other people have drawn so you get used to the, the kind of, uh, of um, pen marks you need to do. Learn about story, learn about uh, uh, storyboarding, uh, learn about design, learn as much as you can about as many different facets of the, of the thing as, as you can. And if you really want to get into animation, I, I suggest ignoring when, uh, when adults tell you because people said this to me all the time, you have to, you, you have to concentrate on one thing and good, get good at that one thing. And, uh, and I am now, I, I looked myself up on Google the other day and it said, Dan Pavenmeyer is a, and it was this multi-hyphenate uh, storyboard artist, animator, producer, director, writer, composer, songwriter, voice actor. Is like, you know, like my, my hyphenate of what I do for a living. And I do all of those things for a living. And they say, Jack of all trades, master of none. Okay, but I've been nominated for an Emmy in every single one of those categories, I think. So, so it is possible to do all those things well. Um, just do the things that you, that, that you love to do and, 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 and move through life that way, I think. You figure out what you love to do and uh, and do that, and then figure out how to make a living at it. That's my my best advice I can give you people. Um, the next question is: Is script uh, script writing and storyboard art a dying field? It is not. Um, the only thing in in animation that is that could be considered a dying field, in, in just in that it is not being used as much, 
is is actually doing the animation drawings for a for a feature movie because so much features is now being done with the CGI. Those those CGI movies are still being storyboarded by people on not necessarily paper. We storyboard now on a tablet. You know, I'm 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 watching this on a tablet that I draw and fix fix drawings and animate on uh, myself. Um, storyboarding and write and script writing will always be necessary. You, you you can't. There will never be a computer that you can say, "All right, uh, uh, write a story," and it'll tell you a, a story that will work at all. It's not. It's not the way it works. Uh, that that will always be something that has to be done by people. So that's not a d dying art at all. Uh, the next one is what if your portfolio is as good as your competition, but you don't have the industry experience. How do you land that entry job? Getting the first job is always the hard job to get. Um, once you have that job, then, then you have experience that people, other people will hire you for. And a lot of the times it's a matter of being the person who is, is one of the resumes on the top of the, of the pile when that production needs people. The you know in in TV there's a there's there's a there's time where they're hiring people, and there's time when they're not hiring people. Uh, when once they're in production, they've got everybody set, and they're not hiring anybody until the the next season starts, or they lose somebody. So it's uh, it's about being being there at the right time in the in, in the right place. I got my first gig on the Ninja Turtles, uh, and I'd done a couple little animated segments for feature films uh, that were not animated feature films, just like, you know, uh, I did the Hippie Land dream sequence from Tommy Chong's movie, the first movie he did without Cheech. I did the animated opening titles to Adam Sandler's first movie. And, uh, and, but I'd never worked in a studio and I took in a portfolio that I realized now was not even terribly appropriate for working in animation. And, uh, and, but, but I took it in uh, to the Ninja Turtles because they had they had had a uh, an ad they had put out looking for storyboard artists, and the guy was looking through it, and I was tell and I was I told him, look, I'm going to to visit my parents, and because my parents are going out of town, and I'm going to house sit for them, and I'm just going to be making food for my for my uh, young sister, and that's all I'm going to be doing. I don't know anybody there. I will have basically my entire day free to work on this project if you, if you give me some work. And he was like, oh, oh. And he found like one drawing in my portfolio that made him go, okay, I think maybe he can do this. I'm gonna take a chance on him for one week's worth of work. And he did that and I turned it in, he loved it and he hired me every week for like a year. So, um, so it's sort of being in the right place at the right time and just being always open to that, to that opportunity. Uh, next is on Family Guy. Huge fan. Did you ever have a folder of ready-to-go physical comedy cutaways uh, or that reminds me of that time type sequences that you could draw from or were you making them up on the spot as you went? In, if the former is true, there's a, is there a secret archive of those unused sequences, sequences? And if it's true, can I come over with a bottle of wine and watch some? Um, there it is true that somewhere there are storyboards for lots of those that have gotten cut. Um, if anybody remembers, there was a South Park episode that was sort of lampooning Family Guy and saying that it was being written by manatees because F Family Guy was this show where you could, any, any physical gag that you could think of, any, any visual or, or scripted gag that you could think of, you could conceivably put it into a Family Guy episode because they would do these cutaway gags where it's like, oh yeah, it was like that time that I fought that chicken and you cut to him fighting a chicken. Um, and it didn't have to do anything with the story. That's why they said it was, it was uh, written by manatees. They had idea balls that they would push into a thing and then they would, they would write that cutaway gag. As soon as that episode uh, aired of South Park making fun of us, uh, I was in the in the editing room uh, finishing an episode with Seth MacFarlane, and uh, and we were trying to cut it down to time. And I said, and I said, well, we can cut this cutaway gag because that's a manatee gag. 
Uh, and he didn't even ask me what that meant. He said, yeah, that's a manatee gag, meaning it had nothing to do with the story around it. We can save this because he liked all the gags in it. And I said, well, we can cut this and use it in a later episode. And he said, yes, we can. We just took it out and we put it in my next episode so that, uh, so that you know, it, it didn't go to waste. But, uh, but so there are a lot of things that got cut for time and a lot of them were really funny, but, but at some point you have to cut something and you would pull stuff out. I don't think that they have a file of them somewhere. I think that the individual directors have stuff they, they've saved. And I think that the writers have stuff that they've saved that they try to uh, uh, put somewhere. In the Phineas movie that we just finished, we have a gag that was written in 2011 for a different movie entirely and that never got made. And I always loved that gag. And we got to a place where suddenly it was like, oh, this is the same sort of situation. I think we can use that gag. Who, wait, who has that? And we had to go back through the archives and, and, and search and try to find this, this particular little uh, piece of dialogue that we put in. And we put it in and, uh, and I was so happy because it, it had stuck in my mind for so long. I was like, let's save that gag that didn't get, get to see the light of day. When we did the audience test, the Phineas and Ferb fans counted that as one of their favorite moments in the entire in, in the, the entire movie, which I, which made me very happy because it's it's a weird when you see the movie, it's when they are going faster than the speed of light and reality starts to break down. That will tell you what what it is when you see it. Um, uh, okay, next one is. What should a high school high schooler start learning now if they want to start an animation or comics career? I'll tell you, there's two books that I always recommend to anybody who wants to get into animation. One is uh, Cartoon Animation by Preston Blair. It's a great, great book all about animation, about drawing for the characters, about construction lines and, and lines of action and posing. It's a great book. And the other one is a, a, a great book with a really silly title. It's called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way by Stan Lee. That book is, those two books are on everybody's desk if you go into any animation studio. Um, the, if, you, if you really want to, to learn about visual storytelling and how to draw characters that have a, a really clear movement or pose or anything like that, Study those two books. That's, that's my biggest thing I can tell you to do. Um, can you discuss the pros and cons of developing content via low budget indie route, i.e. Banging, banging your head against the wall for years while draining your life savings versus pitching to established uh, studios, i.e. brown nosing the uh, devil incarnate? Um, the, 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 the best thing about coming up into animation or filmmaking of any sort at this time is you do not need to wait for a studio to give you millions of dollars to make your content. You can make your content and put it on uh, TikTok right now. I do a lot of TikTok uh, since quarantine started. I just started making little movies and putting them on TikTok and I'm having a great time and, the, and an audience is finding it. It, a, a larger audience is probably finding my stu stuff than if I was just a 50 year old guy on, on TikTok because of Phineas and Ferb. But, uh, but I, you know, I like write little skits with my daughters. I, I, uh, I do special effects. I, you know, I got an editing program so I can do green screen. I've got a green screen that I can roll up behind me here and, and, uh, and shoot stuff. Um, you can also animate now a lot easier. There's programs that will allow you to do it. You can use Flash, you can use uh, uh, Storyboard Pro. There's also sorts of things that will allow you to do limited animation or full animation. And then you can make little movies and put them out on the internet. The guy who did, who, uh, who, who created uh, Rick and Morty, the co-creator of Rick and Morty is a guy named Justin Brinsfield. Um, he used to be at, uh, at Disney with me. And he made this short called Doc and Marty, which was sort of taking off on the, um, on the uh, 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 Doc and Marty from Back to the Future. And he made this little animated short, really super rough, 
but you could really feel the comedy of it and the and the the feel of it. And he just put it on the internet, and that's how he sold Rick and Morty. And, and you know, and now he's doing Solar Opposites for for Hulu. Um, it's uh, you can get your stuff seen by people without having to go through a studio now. Now that is really a plus. Um, if once you get a certain number of followers, you can monetize that. I don't know how that happens, but I know that, the, that there's people out there who are just doing the internet, just doing TikTok, just doing Instagram and Twitter and stuff. Uh, Zach King, who was like the king of Vine uh, when, it, when it was a, a thing and, and started off on YouTube and now he's on TikTok. Um, I've met him, we, we, we've done some, some stuff together and uh, super, super nice guy. He's probably 30 years old now he's probably making more money than me. I've never had that conversation with him, but he is all over the internet and he just decided that's what he wanted to do as a filmmaker. He started off wanting to be a filmmaker, found out what uh, a jungle it is just to try to get your thing made and, and just you know didn't want to be that part of that part of the business, which is a part of the business I don't even like being, being a part of. Um, he just wants to make content and that's the, I completely understood that. When I came up, you had to have somebody buy your content and put it out because you couldn't distribute it yourself. Now you can distribute it yourself. So you're coming up in a good time. Can you give us tips before sending a pitch Bible? Um, the, the pitch Bible on Phineas and Ferb was, I think, sort of a, a quintessential pitch Bible that I put together. I, I did a couple pages on what, uh, well, I think I started with the characters. I had a drawing of the characters with a very short description of the character that gave you a feeling of who, it, who they are. Uh, Phineas actually had his, his catchphrase in that. Uh, I said, you know, Phineas is always trying to, is doing things that most people would consider above the, the, the pay grade of a nine-year-old kid. When adults in Phineas's world uh, question him on this and say, aren't you a little young to be building a roller coaster? He always says in a flat confidence tone, yes, yes, I am. That was sort of so that he wouldn't be lying because he's not lying. He is a little young to be doing that. Um, and, and, uh, and that was part of the original pitch. I had a, a page for Phineas, page for Ferb, page for Perry and, and uh, Doofenshmirtz. And then I had a, um, uh, uh, a page for Candace and mom and some of the other, uh, other characters. And then I had how the show all works together. I had a thing, you know, and I did art for all of these. I, and, uh, and I had a couple scene setups that I had drawn uh, and uh, none of which I think ended up in the show, some of which end up in the opening title sequence when the, the pictures are going behind Cam uh, Phineas and Ferb. Um, and, uh, and then I had, uh, I don't know, maybe six, uh, just springboard story ideas for it. Like, you know, like what would individual episodes be like? And I'd have like the title of an episode and like a th three or four line thing about what happens in that episode. You know, not a, not a beginning, middle and end, just sort of like the, the, the basic premise of an episode. And then I had a little bit about me, which I, which I think is important because what you're really selling when you're selling a show is yourself. You're selling yourself as somebody who can run a show. Um, I think that Family Guy probably had as much to do with Phineas and Ferb being picked up as I did, because by, by the time I was pitching it to Disney, I'd been pitching that show around for 13 years. And it had gotten, you know, like a lot of the junior executives would like it, and then the next one would like it, and the next one would like it, and then the guy who makes the decision wouldn't like it, or something like that. It got up the echelon at like three different studios. Um, but by the time I went to Disney, I was the, I was director and storyboard supervisor on Family Guy and Family Guy was a huge hit and all the executives at Disney were watching Family Guy. And so they saw me as like, ooh, we can get some of that at our studio. And so they took me much more seriously. And I think that's how I got the, okay, we'll pay you to make a pilot. Once I made the pilot, the pilot tested through the roof. It's probably the best testing pilot they'd had, maybe still ever. I don't, I don't know. It's, it, when I look back at it, I was like, I didn't 
try to do that. But when I look at it now, I'm like, oh my God, that is a perfect testing machine. The, 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 the pilot was so well constructed for, what, for the questions that they ask test audiences. It, it just worked out perfectly. So I, so I did that and, uh, and you know, finally, got, finally got a show. But it was really about whether or not they were ready to hire me to do that. Um, that's why having a show doing a web series or something like that is really going to be helpful to you because the the web series will be um will be something you can point at and say this is uh this is what i do this many people see it and that sort of stuff and they'll get a feel for what the show what the show is so i hope that answers that question um what would be some advice you would give aspiring storyboard artists um i i always say watch movies and then rewatch movies because the first time you watch a movie is sort of hitting you emotionally and you're just involved in the story and stuff. Rewatch movies. I saw Jaws 11 times the summer that it came out. I saw Star Wars 15 times the summer that it came out. I went back and saw the movie over and over and over again. I liked the way it made me feel, but I also wanted to look and see how they were making me feel that way, how the, sh the scenes cut together how that that all works there's a um um there's a a, a a rule about um where to put the camera in storyboarding that uh, that's basically if you're cutting to one person talking like this and they're talking to somebody else the next person when you cut to them they have to be facing this way on the screen um you can draw them uh, what that means is between two people who are talking there's a there's a line of interest and, and or a stage line and you want the camera to be on the same side of that stage line so that the people will be looking like this because if you cut from somebody who's talking like this to somebody else who's talking like this it looks like they're both talking to some third person off screen that whole rule all the rules around that are explained very very well in, a, in the section called continuity in a book called the six C's of cinematography, I think, or the five C's of cinematography, something about C, and that's continuity is one of the C's. Uh, if, if you get that book, there's a place in there that explains it very well. Um, I would learn how to do that and then just really look at how they, okay, when they cut to a new place, they usually cut to what they call an establishing shot. So that people will say, oh, we're in a different place. And then they cut into a two, a two shot or a group shot. And then they start going into close ups and, and, and just sort of see how that works. How like, oh, this shot's really interesting because they put something, they put it down so you could see this plant or something in the foreground, which gave it a feeling of depth. There's a lot of things you can learn just by watching uh, other people do, um, uh, do that stuff. Uh, that is all the questions that I have coming in uh, from, from earlier. Let me look and see what kind of questions we have here. Oh, I have a question for Dan. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's, that's it. So there's a Zoom chat over here. Let me see what I have. Uh, what do you think is the most underrated Phineas and Ferb song? Personally, I've been vibing to my goody two-shoes brothers brother lately. That's pretty good. I, I, you know, it's, I've got a lot of favorite uh, Phineas and Ferb songs. Probably to me, the most underrated one, which is one that I think should have taken off and gotten a life outside of Phineas and Ferb, was the New Year's song for our New Year's episode. Um, it came really late in one of the seasons and it, and, and it just didn't get as much attention as, as I think it did. Plus, I think that episode didn't turn out as good as I wanted it to, to, to turn out. I feel like if that had been a first season show, that would have been a song that everybody would be singing to me on TikTok right now. Uh, but, uh, but to me, I was like, oh, we have an opportunity to write a, a song to celebrate New Year's. Lots and lots of songs are out there for Christmas. Lots of songs are out there for birthdays and stuff like that. But I didn't know of any real, real uh, New Year's song. So, so we wrote a, a New Year's song, which I really like a lot. Uh, in Phineas and Ferb, there's a lot of references to you and Swampy and Danville and Swampy Surf Shop. Are there other staff references? Yes, there's references to lots and lots of people in the, in the show constantly. I would have to find in, individual ones to do that. Um, my, uh, my favorite is Bobby Fabulous from, uh, from uh, um, uh, Love Handle is a spot-on caricature 
of our writer, Bobby Gaylor, who also does the voice of, of Buford. He doesn't quite look like that anymore, and we exaggerated his hair, but he had white hair with the little soul patch and those glasses. And it, it, we, we saw that drawing, one of the board artists did that drawing, Chris Hedrick did that drawing, and I just laughed out loud. But what's more, uh, Danny in Love Handle is me, and Swampy in Love Handle is Swampy. So, so it's, it's the three of us in, in that show. There's also a scene where uh, Candace gets turned into a fly in one episode, so it's got Candace's head on a fly body, and she's flying around and she lands on like a roof or something like that. And there's another fly next to her and she looks over and it's got a human head. And she's like, oh, did you also get shot with a, uh, with a fly uh, ray? And he says, oh no, I was a fly before. I got shot with this human head ray and now I've got this silly thing on. That is exactly a caricature of uh, one of our other writers, Martin Olson. And it's voiced by Martin Olson too. So th that one makes me laugh every time I see it. All right, I'm gonna... Find something low on the thing here. Just yeah, just, I've, I've, I've been gathering some questions for you here. So yes. Okay. First of all, uh, you've got some love coming from Argentina for more than one person. So excellent. I I mean nuestro de miel con con mi esposa uh, in uh, Buenos Aires y las leñas. So I went to I, my 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 honeymoon was in Ar Argentina with, uh, ah. with my wife. So we have a few serious questions and some um, uh, probably hit uh, quick questions about um, about what's happening in the show. So I'm going to start with a couple of quick questions before we pivot back to a few uh, okay. serious ones. Okay. But first, I want to acknowledge uh, that there is an, an amazing conversation happening between Sudarshan, Nico, and Bobby about everything that you say and chat. Right. So okay. It's, it's been pretty. It's been pretty impressive. Well done. Excellent. Um, okay, so this has come up multiple times. Will Phineas cry in the movie? I do not believe Phineas cries in the movie. Candace cries in the movie, and you'll probably cry in the movie. If, if you don't, you're dead inside. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, we did the movie. It was hard for us to come up with a story that we felt like we hadn't told because there were, you know, we did 222 episodes and seven hour long specials and another movie. And, uh, but, but we decided that most of the stories are always just driven by the boys trying to do something really fun every day. What if we have a story that's driven by more urgency of somebody in jeopardy? We'd never had a, a story, we'd put people in jeopardy before, but that's ne that had never been the thrust of the story. And the thrust of this story is Candace gets kidnapped by aliens and taken away and the boys have to go rescue her. And, uh, and so Candace goes through a big thing in this, and we bring her to a real low point uh, so that we can bring her back up. And there, there's just some really great stuff at the, at the end of this movie. I, it, it makes me cry, so, uh, so hopefully it'll make you guys tear up a little bit. But it's also just all full of fun, which was the hard part. Let's try to do something that has real stakes, but never stops being fun, which was, you know, and I think, I think we really hit it. Right, right. Hey, hey Dan, uh, actually something real quick since we have some kids on, uh, you yes. gotta do a voice, you gotta do a voice. <laughs> All right, when, I, when Dr. Doofenshmirtz talks, it's my silly voice that comes out of his face. And when he says, curse you, Perry the Platypus, that's, it, I'm, I'm probably ruining it for you right now by doing it on screen, but uh, yeah. yes, that, that's me. And on, if you guys watch Milo Murphy's Law, I'm also Dakota on Milo, Milo Murphy's Law. He's way down here like this. And for second season of Milo, we had Dr. Doofenshmirtz on Milo Murphy's Law. And we had one whole scene where it was Doofenshmirtz talking to Dakota back and forth. And, and so I had to try to jump back and forth and, and talk like this and then talk like this. It's from like both sides of my register. <laughs> you have no idea how many people in chat were asking about to hear those voices. So <laughs> well, there you go. I'm also nang 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 nang, which is Klimpaloon, the uh, the old timey bathing suit. <laughs> What's one guy just went? Oh, oh my god! <laughs> so uh, I'm you know, and I'm uh, I'm the the guy who originally asks uh, Phineas, "Aren't you a little young to build a roller coaster?" That's just my voice. And then when we did the roller coaster musical episode, I had a whole song. Aren't you a little young to build a roller coaster? It's fun. <laughs> so that that's me. And I'm also the only actress, <laughs> the only actor or actress other than uh, uh, than Ashley Tisdale to voice Candace in the episode where Candace uh, has the allergic reaction and her voice gets really low. 
that's me saying, oh, Jeremy saved me a seat. And when I sing the, and I sing the E-V-I-L-B-O-I-S song, that's me as well. <laughs> so. Nice. Um, repeat a question. So uh, I will give you the props for, for a cut and paste. Why does the OWCA give agents host families? Can you give us some details of that? Uh, well, because they don't have the, uh, the infrastructure in their building to, uh, to feed and, and uh, provide shelter for all those animals. So it's, 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 it's a win-win. The kids get a nice pet, and they don't have to, have to pay for their room and board. There you go. Um, okay, let's pivot to something a little bit more serious. So you mentioned the questions that were asked to a test audience for the pilot episode. Do you recall any of those test questions? I do not. That was uh, that was like uh, like twelve or thirteen years ago. Oh, it was two thousand five. It was fifteen years ago. So uh, so I don't. But but it, but it's like which which characters do you relate to the most? How much you know who who. Who loves this? Who hates? Who hates it? Who likes it? Who likes it a little? And the, the loves were all like eighty percent or, or or greater, and 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 everybody else was was likes it. I'll tell you when I first realized it was going to be a hit, is they had sent uh, when we tested the first three episodes. I guess they had sent two episodes home with kids on DVD or or VHS probably at the time, and then they had the kids come in and watch a third episode while we watched them watch it from on the other side of a, of a one-way mirror. And, uh, and there was this room full of, you know, uh, seven to 11 year old girls who are watching, watching this episode. And most of them had memorized the theme song already. And when Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated happened, they sang along and looked at each other like, aren't we cool that we know this? And I was like, Oh man, they watched this a lot of times. I think this is going to be a big hit, and and then it was. The 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 other thing I remember from that testing is, and I tell this to to young showrunners all the time because the, a lot of people, uh, a lot of creative people have trouble dealing with executive notes because you if you work at a studio, you do a, you do your creative thing and then you give it to the executives and they want to give you notes on on what you should and shouldn't do in it and what you should cut out and stuff and uh and i had one of my my uh, uh writers tell me once dan i know what your superpower is and i said well do enlighten me because if i can fly i want to know about it because i have a long commute and it would be very helpful and he said no your superpower is dealing with executive notes. I've never seen anybody do it as well as you do. I'm in the meeting with them. I know by what you just said that you're not going to take their note. And what's more, I know that they know by what you just said that you're not going to take their note and yet they're still smiling. How do you do that? And I said, oh, well, it's sort of a Jedi mind trick, uh, but you, it's, it's how you don't take the note. If they say, I think the sky should be green. You don't say that's a stupid idea, even though that might be a stupid idea. What you say is, hmm, okay, I think I see what you're going for. Maybe a better idea, a better way to get there would be if we made the sky blue. And then they go, I just gave him a great idea because they feel part of the process. The executives in, a, in, in any entertainment business are just trying to be part of the process. They wanna be part of something that entertains the world. That's why they're in entertainment. That's, uh, you know, but, but so you, you want to make sure that you're, you're not destroying their ego when they suggest something, right? You, you know, uh, you, you don't shut it, shut it down and say, no, we're not doing that. You, say, you, you, you sort of do a yes and like you're doing improv and you go, okay, you do that. And if you can't think of anything good to solve the problem that that note is pointing out, then you say, okay, we'll take a look at that. And that's as non-committal as you need, need to be. But I remembered in the testing, uh, uh, there was the, all these kids watching the, the, the show and, uh, and some line came on, got a big laugh in the room. And the executive who's sitting next to me said, that was my pitch, that was my pitch. And she, hey guys, guys, that was my pitch. She 
was so excited that her pitch had A, made it through, and B, she got to see kids laughing at it. And I remembered as soon as she said that, that, oh yeah, I remember she pitched this at a thing. And I said, okay, yeah, let's do that. If what the executive is, 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 is pitching actually works, absolutely use it. If, it's, if it works as well as what you were thinking, use theirs because it, will, it buys you so much goodwill and you you can't you can't uh, you can't put a price on that because because that that executive felt absolute ownership of that show because it was a show that she felt like she had actually had a, a real effect on. I feel like there's and, uh, executives as well as uh, relationships there. So. Yeah, no, it works in all areas of life to just remember that other people have egos and, and, uh, and you know, are sensitive about the things that they're creating and putting out there. Dan, just want to uh, bring your notice. Uh, uh, there's an on-screen shout out. Bastion wants Milo Murphy season three. You know, so do I, Bastion. <laughs> so do I. Uh, the, the problem with Milo is that Milo got made at a time where they were suddenly moving all of the cartoons onto Disney XD, which is sort of uh, Disney's uh, redheaded stepchild network that they had that, that uh, you know, only got like a, a third of the viewers could even see it. And then the, the ones that could see it, a lot of them couldn't find it because, because it was in a weird place on everybody's cable systems. Like all the, all the cable systems I knew had like, like Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, and, and Cartoon Network right next to each other, like 222, 223, 224. So kids could just go up and down back when you used to watch TV that way with a remote that would go up and down channels. And, and XD was always like 1307. You know, so, so, so people really had to know about XD and really look for it in order for that to, to have, uh, have taken off. So it was, there were a lot of bad decisions being made above us, uh, I think. And, and I used to say that nobody, uh, nobody at, the, at the channel really tried to get people to see Milo a first time. You know, uh, when, when I pitched the first episode uh, to uh, Rich Ross, who was the, the head of the channel at the time, uh, he had heard how, how great it was to, to, when we were pitching these shows live. Um, and he wanted me to come and pitch one of the first episodes to, to, to him. And I got all these boards and went over to, uh, to the, the Disney Channel building, which was in a slightly different part of town. And, uh, and I pitched it to him and he laughed in all the right places. And at the end of it, he said, I'm so glad this is good, Dan, because I just told the shareholders this was going to be our first big number one animated hit. So don't make a liar out of me. But, you know, no pressure. And I said, well, I'll be honest. Uh, Rich, I don't really feel the pressure because all I can do is give you a funny show, a good funny show that people will watch a second time. You're the only person who can make them watch it a first time. And, and he was like, oh, don't worry. I will make them watch it a first time. And, and he absolutely delivered on that promise. And that's why the show got so, so big is because I gave them a good funny show and he made people watch it the first time. He, put, he, he did a sneak peek of the first episode after, um, after High School Musical 2, which they knew were going to get, get huge ratings. So there was an 11 minute after that. Then he did a couple other sneak peeks. And then the entire month of February, they did a new Phineas and Ferb every day at the same time for the entire 28 days of Feb February. And so people really saw that, th th that show. When Milo never really lit up the boards, I told them at a meeting once, I said, you know, I, I told them that story. And I said, I, I'll be honest, I don't think there's anybody at this channel who can honestly say that they worked hard to get people to watch Milo the first time. People who saw Milo liked Milo, but it just never got the audience that it did. What I'm hoping is that on, on, it's on XD right now. If you haven't seen it, it's called Milo Murphy's Law. It stars uh, Weird Al Yankovic. Uh, as as Milo and uh, Chrissy Fit from uh, uh, from Teen Beach Movie and Sabrina Carpenter from Girl Meets World, it's um, it's a really good show. I, I I love the show. I think it's every bit as good as Phineas. I'm hoping that people find it on X on uh, Disney Plus, and that uh, you know the whole series is there. It's a really good bingeable show because it has a whole series arc, and 
And if enough people find it there and it starts getting an audience there, then we'll, we'll be able to get Disney to give us a third season. But right now they have shinier objects to look right. for. They started going, ooh, Phineas and Ferb, that did really well for us. Let's do more of that. And, you know, so Dan, I, I know you have a hard stop uh, coming up here at one. There is uh, one question. I can, I can question. go a little over. Okay, over. perfect. Yeah. There's one question here I want to push up uh, from uh, Megan. Um, my friend and I want to create our own cartoons together someday. Her strong suit is art while mine is writing. Would we have to both master the other skill to be successful? You do not have to master the other skill to, to be successful. It, it, will help if, it will help you guys work together if you both at least understand what the other person does and are, and are able to, um, to, to, you know, like it's, it's better when you write if you understand the visual medium and it's better in, in the visual medium if you, uh, in doing storyboards, if you understand storytelling. And so you, you should learn, you should at least understand each other uh, better. I think it'll help a lot. Okay. Dan, mm -hmm. we have a guest star. Uh, Baluni is a uh, Su Sudar son has uh, Baluni. Baluni. <laughs> Baluni. That's excellent. I also see that someone has a recurring raccoon shirt on, which I'm going to have to take a picture of and send it to my friends who, who, you know, recurring raccoon was a, um, was a point of contention in the writers' room. Can, can you can you can you can you puff it up there so we can we can there we go. Look at that. I'm gonna I'm gonna send that to Valerie and she's gonna love it <laughs> because because uh, because uh, some some people loved Recurring Raccoon and some people like I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I it always made me laugh. So I was put put it in. It was just. Uh, and he had his own theme song. You've seen him before. You're gonna see him soon. He's recurring raccoon. So <laughs> it was uh, it was silly. So what's um, the next question? Can you give us any information about your new pilot that comes? I don't think I'm allowed to really say anything about what it is about. Um, uh, it's uh, I, I I like it a lot. It's it's the it's the first show done in a, in a while w without Swampy. Swampy's doing uh, Pete the Cat over at uh, his his own studio. So so this would be ju just me. Um, and uh, but uh, but I love it a lot. We just literally a, an, an hour ago did the um, the testing uh, debrief. We we tested it a couple weeks ago and. You know, it looks really good. The testing numbers were really good, so um, I I think it's a really good shot that that the that I'll do a show and it'll get on the air again, which would be which would be nice. Um, uh, I at least have a track record behind me, so you know, it's it's I don't have to convince them that I can that I can do a a show. Actually, it, it, that was one that I didn't even write a script for them. I just did the pilot in Storyboard Pro recorded voices with with my uh, with my daughters and me and and uh, and just made a made a an, a pilot animatic you know like a super super rough pilot and just showed that to them and suddenly like all of the, they had this long schedule that was going to go up through november of uh, of testing and you know like we're going to do animation for th for three minutes of it and then we're going to do this and we're going to do this and 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 you know they had this whole long schedule that as soon as they saw it all sort of done they were like oh well we don't need this we don't need this we don't uh, uh, okay and, and they kept moving it moving it back so they moved back the testing like six months because they were like oh we don't need to do the animation because that's really for us to figure out whether or not this guy can run a show and we know he can run a show. So, so it, you know, it's, it's made things a lot easier. So what is the, is your favorite episode of Phineas and Ferb? And can you say hello uh, there, but uh, hello there as Dr. Doofenshmirtz. The, um, my favorite episode of Phineas and Ferb is, uh, is, a, is a hard one. I think that the, um, uh, the, uh, it's weird. I'm only seeing one person's phone up here uh, in the in the view. I usually see everybody else. Uh, Let me try to switch. Yeah. So I think some somebody is uh, is share is sharing their screen, which they shouldn't probably be doing. Uh, but um, the uh, uh, summer belongs to you is probably 
before this movie, my favorite thing that, I, that I've done, certainly the last 11 minutes of Summer Belongs to You is the best storytelling and storyboarding I've done uh, up, up, up until this point. Either that or the first movie, the, uh, the second dimension has a really great ending, but, but there's so many great character moments. Um, in Summer Belongs to You, we actually have Phineas give up, which he's, which he's never done. And it was specifically so that this scene would happen because Isabella, who is in love with Phineas, took him to, the, to Paris and, uh, because it's the city of love. And she tried to sort of show him how romantic everything is. And he just wasn't paying attention because he was trying to solve this problem. And then now they crash landed on a, uh, um, on a, a de desert island and he's and she's just been dejected this whole for the last like 20 minutes and uh and she and she's sort of crying by herself and and ferb comes over just to t to console her a little bit and she says you know ferb i was on this the, i was in the most romantic place in the world and he did not even notice me i just feel uh, feel so de defeated look even now he's still trying to solve this problem and he and phineas is over there trying to figure out a way to get off this island you know like well, oh we could we could do this no we can't do that we can, you know like and everything he's coming up with is coming up blank and isabella looks to ferb and says you know and i would just give anything in the world if he would just sit down next to me and watch this beautiful sunset because the sun's setting the thing and the sun is also our ticking clock because he's got, got to get home before the sun goes down in order to win this bet and and Phineas comes over next to her and says, says or we can dig a truck. No, we can, I don't. And he sits down next to her and he says, I guess we can't do it. Well, at least we can watch this beautiful sunset together. And he turns to her and she does not take that. This is the thing she's wanted more than anything in the world. But instead she says, no, we are not gonna uh, watch this beautiful sunset. That is not that is not the guy that I fell into this situation with. You're gonna I mean, and she talks to him and she talks him up, and it's more important to hit to her that he is the person that he is than for for her to get what she wants. And that like I'm crying right now when I describe it. It's uh, it's to me that's a great turn. And then there's a bit where, where Buford hands out all the, all the bikes. And then there's this big musical number at the beginning. That is probably my favorite actual episode of the show. Nice, nice. So um, but because we have a lot of folks who are the creatives here, um, here here's one for them. Uh, what do you consider to be essential elements while designing appealing characters and a unified design such as uh, the PNF and Marvel characters? Uh, such as the what characters? Uh, the, the Phineas and Ferb. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Phineas was the first one I did. Uh, and he was literally just, I wonder if I can draw a character who looks like a triangle. Because I'd worked on a lot of shows with different shapes. Uh, and, you know, and a friend of mine was pitching a show that had, uh, had square-headed characters. And I, I didn't find it really appealing, but I was really oh, that's really cool that he's coming up with, he's trying different geometric shapes. And so I was sitting at a, in a restaurant in South Pasadena and, uh, and they had butcher paper on the table with like a little can of crayons for you to doodle while you're, while you're waiting. And I drew Phineas by trying to draw a character, like I wonder if I could draw somebody who looked like a triangle. And I drew him and I loved it. And I drew him three, three more times, took it home and I drew the rest of the characters that night. Um, and took it to work the next day, and Swampy and I created the whole show from the, from those original drawings. Um, the that was me trying to do something that I had not seen before. I think it's always good to to do something new and different. Um, but also, he just appealed to me when I saw saw it. I do I draw all the time. I'm constantly doodling, and uh, occasionally I'll see something that really sticks in my brain. I was like, oh, I think I should do something with that. And that was, that was what I felt about, uh, about Phineas. Literally, I drew him. My wife said, ooh, who is that? And I said, and this is a direct quote, I said, that's Phineas. That's the show I'm, this is the show I'm going to sell someday. I literally realized that this is a character that looks so unique that, that we should do it. Now, I did, uh, he changed less than other people did because I wanted to, like Ferb used to have this big round sort of egg shaped nose. And 
the, next to each other, they, they looked really funny, but they didn't feel like they were really in the same universe. So I sort of squared off his nose. I made Doofenshmirtz's head a little uh, more triangular. I started giving everybody more angles so that it would get, so it sort of felt like one universe. So it's, it's really start with the character you like the most and then sort of match everybody else so they feel like they could exist in the same universe. All right, and uh, how do you deal with the writer's or artist block, or in your case, both at the same time? Uh, uh, I rarely have a writer's block, which I, I understand I'm very lucky for that, but I think it's just a function of being in TV uh, in that you, uh, I, you know, I always have to, it's a function of two things. It's always having a, a deadline uh, pushing down on you. The, um, you know, they, they say that you, you write a movie until it's good and you write a TV show until it's Friday. And that's, uh, that's often the way it works. Um, I, I, I tend to always be able to force myself to do stuff. And I think that the other reason that is, is because I've written enough that I know that the first thing I write is not going to be what it ends up being. So, so I get over the whole, like, is this good enough kind of thing? You know, like, I know that I'm going to have to go back and rewrite anyway. And a lot of what stops people from writing is, you know, when you, when you start writing something, you have a bunch of scenes in your mind that you like, but there's there's other scenes that go in between those scenes or build up to those scenes that you have to write. And you don't have anything in your mind for the, for those. You've got this really great scene here and this pretty good scene here, and you need to write the, this connective tissue. The connective tissue is the hardest stuff to write because you end up comparing it to the, to the um, but that's not as good as this scene or this scene. I got to make everything as good. You don't have to make everything as good. You have to make it, you have to make sure you don't make everything the same amount of good because it won't work. When, uh, when I was on Family Guy and um, and Seth would uh, would say, okay, we got a bunch of visual gags that we want here. I'm just going to let you come up with the visual gags. You got 12 seconds to have um, democracy sweeping across Iraq or something like that. Just put in a bunch of visual gags and uh, to, to music. I, I, I just trust you. Go. I would start write, doing visual gags and I would draw the visual gags and I would start putting them in order and I would always end up feeling like the first one didn't work as well as the others. So I needed to replace it with something funnier. And then I'd draw something funnier and I'd put it there and it wouldn't work. So I'd put it later and I would keep trying to replace the, 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 the first one before I realized, oh no, the first one shouldn't be as good as the others because you want it to have a build. The first one should be a smile. The second one should be a chuckle. The third and fourth could be like slightly bigger chuckles. You, you, you want like the next to last one to be the biggest laugh. And so, so you would put the, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of knowing that some of the stuff is not going to be as good as some of the other stuff. And then if you need it to be good and it's not good now, you can go back and, and make, it, make it good later. Hey, Dan. Um, yes. You showcased your music and uh, composing part. Do you have a guitar you could just play a quick lick for everybody? <laughs> I probably do. Let me uh, let me see what has strings on. I don't know that anything's in tune. Let me see. So uh, okay, uh, can you see me here? I'll, I'll go down a little so you get to see the guitar. Um, I'll back up. How about that? Um, so in uh, in two thousand five, Swampy and I were sitting in. Uh, uh, we had one hour between two meetings and uh, and we were trying to come up with what we should uh, do during that hour and we, were, we, we decided we should write the Perry the Platypus theme and uh, and Swampy said I think it should have like a like a like a, a sung you know like like a guitar lick but it's sung so that kids when they're playing P P Perry the Platypus can sing something like dooby dooby doo ba dooby dooby doo ba and I was like Exactly like that. It should be your... And then I said, what should the lyrics be? And Swampy was at his desk and he, and he said, well, let's find out what a platypus is. And he types into, into Google. And the first thing came up was the wiki and it said, 
it's uh, platypus is a semi-aquatic egg-laying mammal. And I said, of action, he's a semi-aquatic egg-laying mammal of action. And that's, uh, and that's how that whole thing got started. The, the uh, um, Gene knows this because he's asked me to play songs from the show that I don't remember anymore. We wrote these songs in an hour 10 or 15 years ago and played them just for that hour and then I never had to play them again. So a lot of times he'll ask me for songs like, I don't know, I would have to listen to it. But the one that I remember because, just because it's one of the first ones that we did was... Uh, uh, bow chicka bow wow, that's what my baby says. Mow mow mow, my heart starts pumping. Chicka chicka chew wow, never gonna stop. Gitchy gitchy goo means that I love you. Gitchy gitchy goo means that I love you. Gitchy gitchy goo means that I love you, baby, 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 baby. baby. Gitchy gitchy goo means that I love you. So <laughs> that's. That's one that I can always do because it's three, well, it's four chords. I got to tell you, if, if we didn't have everyone on mute, we would have had a big sing along right there. <laughs> yes. The, I saw people's lips moving. Screen, you know. I saw people's Dan, lips Dan, moving. Dan, give us a, a couple lines of uh, E-V-I-L-B-O-O-S. We, we E-V-I-L-B, oh, you want, with the, I got to get the guitar back up. <laughs> Two people just melted. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, those boys are always up to something. It's bringing me to tears. Just looking for you get home, it always magically disappears. Those boys are evil. I think it's an E. <laughs> Hold on. Those boys are evil. But before you get home, they somehow always clean up the mess. Those boys are evil. E-V-I-L-B-O-I-S. Something like that. <laughs> Nico's been requesting that for a while, so there you go. All right. All right. Uh, we know you got a lot of stuff going on uh, today. If there yep. are uh, other questions we haven't gotten around to, let's talk later. Maybe we can put those in uh, written format right. answers. Well, let, let, let's take one more question, and, and we'll call it a day. One more question. OK, here it is. I was Figuring like 1115 be good. Yeah. Did yeah. you guys ever consider continuing the story from the second dimension and from the tales of resistance? That's Mary's question. <laughs> uh, well, we did that. We did one 22-minute uh, episode that sort of uh, to, uh, continued that, uh, the t which was the tales from the resistance. Um, we haven't felt a huge need to, because because we you know Phineas and Ferb's real world is is so rife with possibilities, but uh, but you know I would always revisit that if we ever did if we really upped the uh, like re-upped the series which there there has occasionally been talk about um, we would we would do that or uh, or bring characters from that into this uh, this universe or something. Uh, that that was a really fun story. I, re I really enjoyed it, but uh, I sort of feel like it's sort of over. We would have to figure out what what else would happen. So, but I never say never to anything. I'm I'm up for all sorts of stuff. So, last thing, uh, quick your your plug. I don't think you mentioned when it's going to premiere. Uh, uh, Candace uh, Candace Against the Universe, Phineas and Ferb the movie Candace Against the Universe is uh, is dropping on Disney Plus at on August 28th, which is like, I guess in three weeks, in 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 three weeks, Friday, August 28th, and please watch it. I it's one of the things I'm the most proud of doing in in my entire career. So, you go. Well, it's nice talking to all you guys. Hi, Thank Carly. You. I see you there. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us with our, for our AMA. And uh, be well. Have a good day. Ciao.